Wow, Jennifer, you must be really popular. <laughs> Look at all the people. Oh my god! I think it's you. You're the draw. <laughs> I'm just. I just sent out the emails. Um, wow. We will just start start kind of talking. Okay, so tonight what we're doing is um, we're just having a little bit of a Q&A to answer any questions that people have, but also just, you know, Donna and I, when we get together, we just go on and on and on. We can't on. stop talking <laughs> <laughs> or laughing. I know. Yeah, I know. People are shocked, um, but, right. you know, we love this topic. So we just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to ask us any questions if they, if you have them. So mm -hmm. anything that has been on your mind that keeps you up at night, um, you know, about signs of reading, but you yeah, know, right. we could we, <laughs> we could give marriage, we could give marriage <laughs> advice. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I should clarify science of reading concerns, <laughs> right? Classroom concerns, um, different grade levels. My background, I started out in high school and kind of worked my way down. Um, I spent a lot of time in middle school and then also um, first and second grade. Uh, I spent five weeks in kindergarten. That was enough. That was a long, <laughs> you and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> 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 I forgot about that movie, but yes, I totally, I totally agree. Uh, I tried to teach kindergarten. I, I volunteered to do it while they were waiting for a replacement teacher. Um, and I, cause I'd never taught it. I thought, oh, this will be great. Um, but it was in a school that had no walls. You know, they were the open classroom floor plan. And so it was like, it was like herding cats. <laughs> Get them all, you know, organized and learning, but I was just starting to get good when they brought in the teachers, <laughs> just in the nick of time, probably. And if you notice, uh, the school without walls doesn't exist anymore. No, this was, they started it again. So it was when I was, when I was a kid in the seventies, they had, it was a new thing, no right. walls. Right. Um, but one of the schools in Atlanta where I was working in the early two thousands, they built it as this new concept. I was like, are you kidding? The architect must have been 30. <laughs> and was it based on research is my question. I, I don't know yeah, what right? it was based on. What would but... Hattie have to say about that? <laughs> right? I had a lot. The one I of his 256 say. things or whatever he looks at. Yeah. Well, and the way that I cackle when I laugh that none of the people around me really like that all too much. So <laughs> they're like, yes, we could hear that you were here. I'm like, okay, sorry. Um. But so anybody who wants to ask us a question, all you have to do is type it in the Q&A um, and we will gladly, um, you know, answer it for you. We have, you know, a couple things that people have already sent ahead that we were going to get started with talking about. But um, right now, I figure we can just start with a little bit of introductions. So Donna, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm Don Heitmanick. I'm a retired um Started off as a special education teacher, just like you, but not high school. Don't like high school. Um, I do like the little ones. And um, and in the latter part of my career, I was certified to be a reading interventionist. And um, so and that's a whole nother story, but got that done. And uh, after 41 years, I was done. And um, then I started this other second career, which is not by choice. <laughs> But it's all good. It's all good. So um, running the Facebook page and, um, you know, doing things like this has just been a, a real blessing in my life. Well, it's amazing the reach that you've had. So, um, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and couldn't even imagine having as many people like on a platform as you have been able to amass, which is which is pretty impressive. And so we're all grateful for that. Um, anything to get the word out and for people right. to kind of see what, what's going on is great. Um, okay, so let's start with the first question. So the first question that I have is, um, what scope and sequence can you use for older non-readers or very low readers? 
Do you want to answer? <laughs> I I personally think that the biggest thing is always start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <clears throat> if they're older, there's probably something that they didn't learn when they were really young, when they should have learned it. And so what people think is that if you start from the beginning with older kids, they're going to be upset. Um, they're going to feel like they're being talked down to, but it's all the way you do it. You know, you can start at the very beginning with sounds and, and, and sound symbol relationships um, and teach them in a way that they don't feel like they're being talked down to. Um, when I start with my sounds, I'll, I'll, you know, I start with like voiced and unvoiced sounds like, and with my older kids, I would say, you know, these are bilabial stops and, you know, talk a little bit about linguistics, make them feel like this is definitely a complex subject, which it is. Um, and, you know, and then work into it. Then when I have buy-in, then I can just keep, keep going. You know, it's, I'm, even when I do CVC, I'll teach them, like if they're reading the word lat, which may seem like a nonsense word, L-A-T, they're like, why do I have to read these little words? I'll say, well, lat actually means side, like latitude or your lats, the muscles down your side, you know, um, or a bilateral agreement. So even these small little bits, you know, can have a lot of meaning in big words and you'll need to know those. So it's, to me, it's about octave and respect and engagement for the older kids and, and then move at the pace that they set for you. If they can go quickly, you can go quickly. If not, they're going to need probably more repetition, but so those like, you know, short vowels are going to be the most common vowels in all words. I mean, especially Latin multisyllabic words, you're going to have those single vowels everywhere. So definitely, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you go over that before you get into the harder stuff. Well, let me add to that. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I'm really on a um, speech to print kick. It's kind of been a, um, a revelation to me. And I've learned OG back in the late 80s. And um, this is just a whole different approach. Um, so you, you letters are involved, of course, but not at first. So you just start with the sounds. And so my question is, if you've got all these older readers, older kids that are, are non-readers, they have probably, and this is just an assumption, been through every program out there and they still haven't figured it out. So why not try something new for them? Be curious about it. What is speech to print? Go out and look at these programs now and, and see if you can start implementing that. I think um, your kids would be able to make that connection a lot faster of, oh, it's, this is coming out of my mouth. Oh, and this is what it looks like in print. It makes a complete difference. Um, and then you'd be able to bring in the phonemic awareness because what I did learn from my dear Mark that passed away was that he never perceived ending sounds and he wasn't so hot at beginning sounds either with the blends. And so now I know what phonemic awareness is. It's, you know, he really couldn't hear those sounds at the end. I used to call them Markisms because he, <laughs> oh, Mark, that's another one you didn't know. And he says, yeah, I never heard it. Never. So, you know, when you have kids that are that disabled um, or folks that are really struggling, you have to really drill down to see what's going on. But I really like the speech, speech to print, and I have not been drinking, uh, speech to print approach because I think it's a different avenue that has not been explored for these folks. And they may just- Yeah, there are, I mean, there are a lot, I mean, mm -hmm. I do speech to print as well. So it's, but when you, the thing that makes the most sense is reading text is not a natural brain process, but oral right. language is. So if you can exactly. activate the oral language and say, this is what you hear, these are the sounds. That's why when I said bilabial stop, you know, it's like, you know, that's your speech production and you mm -hmm. can feel it in your mouth. And then after you've got all these things that you already know about these sounds, then you can talk about the actual letter. And it's so much easier than, you know, taking a letter and having to say, this is the letter A, it says, ah, and then 
all these other ways that it can represent itself, you know, as other sounds. So if you go, if you have 44 sounds in our language and then you anchor to 44, it's way easier than anchoring to all the graphemes in reverse. There's right. a lot less to anchor to. Right. Um, so I think that's super helpful, especially for your low readers, your English language learners. Um, you know, when you work with kids who maybe some of the sounds in our language aren't even in their language, um, teaching them how to produce the sounds in their mouth and, you know, exactly. is going to be super helpful. So I hope, hope that, that answers kind of that question. Answered that for you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, lots of thank yous to you for starting the page. Um, oh my goodness, there's someone from Namibia here. Um, let's see. So the science of reading. How did the science of reading? Yeah, I'm like looking at that. How did it flow from balanced literacy? I when I was reading that, I was thinking it didn't really flow. From Not real well. <laughs> no, it didn't, it didn't flow there and it didn't flow um from it or towards it. I think it's just a, a completely different. Uh, school of thought, um, you know, with balanced literacy. And I have seen balanced people who, schools who said balanced literacy is what they're doing. And um, and it's not awful, but in general, most balanced <laughs> literacy doesn't have enough of the components of reading um, to meet the needs of all kids. And, and I think something that people don't really think about is that uh, teaching reading is a relatively new field. Um, and this is kind of my opinion as a, I love history, but, you know, in eight, up till like 1865, we had illiteracy laws where certain populations weren't even allowed to learn how to read. Um, minorities, women, some women in different regions and, you know, other, you know, immigrant groups weren't even allowed to be taught. Um, and so over time, you know, it's not until the 50s where it became law that we had to really educate. And even in the 60s and the 70s, we, you were, it wasn't mandatory in the beginning of the 70s to come to go to school. There were no truancy laws. You could drop out, you could stay till third grade and quit. Um, and then even then there were tracks where you're just, we know you're going to go into vocational education or, you know, not in college prep. Right about, right about now, is is like the first time in in history where every single kid is supposed to be required to read in the same classroom at the same time and that's new you know like a couple hundred years ago you either had like a governess and you learned to read or and mm -hmm. women as long as you know if you've seen Bridgerton as long as you could play the piano forte you didn't need to know all these things <laughs> but <laughs> um it's new. It's new. So I think we need to be aware of that, that the science is still evolving, that all these things are, you know, how do we teach a room full of kids at the same time when one might have an 80 IQ and one might have 120 and one might have background knowledge and one might not. And, um, you know, it's very demanding for teachers to have to do all of that in one room. Um, and I think we're still working through that and figuring that out. So, you know, I don't know if that answered the question, but um, also you should reach out to us. We're working on a science of reading conference in Africa. So, um, oh, yes. To, we'd love to chat in Botswana. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, okay. I'm very confused um, about the connection between OG process and the science of reading. Do you want to dive into that one? I'm not sure. So are you asking if it's, a, if it is connected, if it's, um, so I think, so I think science of reading is um, the research that tells us how the brain learns to read best, how to optimize that learning process. Um, is OG the way to optimize it? I'm not, sure it is i'm not convinced that it is um again you know i'm trying to embrace new learning um and thinking about what comes first what comes natural our speech comes natural and so if we use our speech first we will 
probably enhance, um, accelerate the learning of our students. Um, I don't know what else to say, Jennifer, you want to yeah. help me? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, I, when I went through my accreditation, I went through a structured literacy and past president of the International Dyslexia Association. I have a daughter with dyslexia, you know, OG, the thing about OG is that when OG came along, there was, it was whole language where nobody was doing any phonics. And, um, and so the, the structure and the rules and the repetition work, but it doesn't mean that there's not something better. And I think OG has embraced that in a lot of the programs that I see, I've seen, um, you know, with my Val Valley and my sound wall from 30 years ago, when people were like, what is that voodoo? Um, uh, I've seen it in a lot of OG classrooms now. Um, there was no phonological awareness in OG, um, you know, a long time ago, but now there is in every lesson. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, it is science of reading. Um, I, but I think we, are always evolving. If we're really scientists, we can't think what we're doing today is is going to be the same thing we're doing in ten years or maybe five years. We, you know, we should be looking exactly. at this and evolving. And uh, I guess an analogy that I use when I do trainings is, you know, the first heart transplant. When they did the first heart transplant and the person lived for two hours or something, you know, they were like, yay. Right now we just have to perfect this. And I think someone lived two days the next time. And, you know, now it, it's right. fairly, I wouldn't say routine, but, you know, it can it be is. done and, it, and it's done, you know, often. Um, the thing about science is that it moves in these increments, like these really small increments. It's not this, um, you know, which education normally sees these giant pendulum swings. Like when the first heart transplant failed, they didn't say, well, the next time someone's heart fails, we're going to amputate their foot, <laughs> you know, like, right? Because like, that would have been like really weird. Um, so, you know, I think that's what we need to be careful of is that keep our mind open to thinking about things differently, trying things that are new, you know, mm -hmm. um, not immediately shutting them down. I, I, I see that as a problem. I think because I think because teachers connect their teaching with a personal investment, and it's 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 my soul I'm giving to my my craft, right? And I think we need to separate that and think what's best for kids. This is not about you. This is what's best for kids. And how do you, if you if you're not open to any new training or any new ideas or any new um, um, uh, not training, um, ideas that are out there, uh, that are researched and you just close them out. Well, then you, you're as a, as a teacher scientist, you're just staying in the past and let's face it, you know, if we are not embracing anything that comes out new based on research, you know, we're just not helping our kids to, we're not optimizing the situation for our kids. So you have to keep there, keep an open mind. Yeah. And there's, I mean, you know, it seems like we do that more with like technology. We're more than willing to jump onto the next exactly. thing. And, you know, like people aren't saying, oh, I'm not going to use a Swiffer. I want to be on my hands and knees. <laughs> but so we have to kind of, come up with this stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, but I feel like analogies work for, for reading because what I've learned about teaching teachers to teach reading is that it is it they're really comfortable teaching science which they don't know a lot about or social studies which they may not know a lot about but when it comes to reading they feel like they have to know everything or they can't teach it instead of being more open to the fact that you're probably not going to know everything you're going to be wrong from time to time probably often um you know and and listening to to what other people say, you know, is going to help you be better, you know? Well, like I, I can tell you in the past five years since I've retired, I think I've learned more in five years than I did when I 
retired. And, you know, you're supposed to be like the pinnacle of your career when you retire, like you're done, you've, you've done it all right. You're, you're ready to go. And since starting the Facebook page and, and meeting all these people and reading more things and being open to all more techniques out there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have learned so much. Why are you going to go back to the classroom? I am not going back. In fact, I did not renew my license. <laughs> oh, I'm like, no, nope. you're going rogue. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing, they wanted my hundred dollars. No, I'm not giving you my hundred bucks. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's, I think that's true, but, but that leads us back to like, um, some of the professional development you get in schools as a teacher, you know, like we need to advocate for better professional development right. and, and more, more follow through follow up and, you know, from the, from the trainings and. Well, that's what know, I can't, you know, as people come to the Facebook page, I look at that platform and I'm thinking there's no way I could glean information out of that platform. And yet it's happening every single day. And people are always writing and saying, thank you so much, you know, for this information. I'm thinking, how did they get that information? I think people are just really hungry and resourceful and trying to figure it out. Um, and they're figuring it out. It just amazes me that a social media platform such as Facebook could be so instructional. I, I, but I, but I think, I think what you're, you may not be seeing is that sometimes I look at it and I think, gosh, someone's asking the same question again. Like I, that question was just asked last week and the week before that, right. and sometimes twice in one day. But when those questions keep getting answered and it comes in front of somebody's view again, like I've had lots of times where I've looked up the origin of a word or something for one of my students. And, um, and then a week later, someone asks me again and I'm like, Oh shoot. I gotta look it up again. Wait, cause I only heard it once. That's right. True. And I'm like, I know I looked it up and I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's French. I can't remember. <laughs> and then right. I go and look it up again. And so this actually happened with, I was teaching the suffix I O N. And so I was like, act. At plus ION is action, right? And I was doing station, S-T-A-T -T plus ION is station. And then the a kid kept saying, what is lotion? And I was like, hmm, hmm. what's a, what is L-O-T? Like I, I had, I looked that word up 10 times before I finally, like over a couple of years before I remembered that it, the origin of it was French, like to wash or something like, oh, so right. Well, because the, the meeting yeah. didn't quite hold over the time right. span, you know, but, um, you know, the, the kids said to me, they're like, you don't know. And I'm like, no, I don't know. I'm like, they're like, I can't believe there are words you don't know. And I'm like, well, on the weekends, I like to hang out with my friends. And then they get this, these are middle schoolers and they go, you have friends. <laughs> like, all I do is look words up. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, it's good that I don't know because then they see like no one's going to yeah. know everything. And, and you, this is how I figure it out. I look it up. Let's look it up together. Let's figure out what, what's going on here. And well, I'm just grateful good. that people are getting it, you know, and that um, it's a resource that people are coming to and finding value. Okay. Next question. Okay, So how, how should one address a belief by some that reading is developmental? and that K-1 should not be given additional time or support if they're having difficulties in the classroom. I'm sorry, I was reading the other question. You missed one. I'm sorry. So how- um, Do you approach oh, that one the, Yeah, so how would you, um, oh, that one I, I thought was basically the same as the one we just yes, answered starting true. from the beginning. Oh, so, um, so I just skipped to the next one, which is, you know, how should one address a belief that reading is developmental, which we hear all the time, like, um, oh, they'll grow into it. They'll get it by next year, you know, and that, you know, K and one should not be given additional time or support if they have difficulties. Um, well, I always say that we are, we all learn at different paces and how can you not give support if, so we're just going to let them drown. Is that how it works? I've seen that a lot that, and I've heard people say, if they don't fail, we can't give them services later. 
instead of preventing the failure, the waiting mm -hmm. till they fail, which makes me very sad. But um, I tell everyone that reading is not developmental. So the prerequisite skills are developmental, you know, like having enough working memory to be able to hold information, you know, having, you know, that, you know, the, all, all the other, you know, retrieval speed being, you know, pretty good. And, um, but all of those things have to be in place for you to start teaching reading. That's why we don't start teaching reading at two years old, you know, or one. Um, so, you know, we know that those prerequisite skills have to be in place, have to be in place for kids to be able to retain it. Um, but that doesn't mean that reading itself is developmental, right? So, um, so the, once you're in school, my personal experience has been typically halfway through kindergarten, kids have enough working memory to be able to hold on to three sounds to blend them. Um, you know, about 90% or more the beginning of kindergarten, I think it's about 50%. So you get a lot of kids going b at, even if they know their sounds and then blending it and saying, you know, butterfly, <laughs> because they're, you know, they, they got the sounds down, but they, they don't have that blending capability. So, because they can't hold everything long enough to be able to blend it, or they say but, at, you know, right, right, right. So, um, and sometimes tab, they look at it backwards to try to refresh right. their memory. And, right. but, um, but yeah, if, if once people understand that, that is the way that it is, there's, you know, man-made tasks are not developmental, right? Like, I mean, I'm 53 and I keep waiting for like being a supermodel to kick in <laughs> like that's it's not developmental. <laughs> you know, like, I think you passed that age. Sorry. Hate I, to think tell you. I, I think I've totally passed that age. I am at the age where I only want to be photographed. Right here. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, it's, you need certain prerequisite skills to be able to be, you know, the best of the best in anything like a NBA player or a supermodel, or you'd have to be tall. You have to be thin. You have to be, you know, for basketball fast and, you know, coordinated and, um, and so not everybody comes to reading with the same prerequisite skills. Not everyone comes to basketball with the same prerequisite skills. Like all of all of the man-made activities, there's a variation in, in, in what you have kind of been dealt. And then it's up to the teacher or the coach or whoever to say, this is where your strengths are. This is where your weaknesses are. And I have to get you to be able to read. Right. Yeah, like, well, let's not even, you know, let's even consider the child find law that is required. So if, mm -hmm. if that child's not getting the services he or she needs and is being ignored because they should wait until second grade, that's, that's against the law. Um, and not only that, I mean, there's so much research out there that early intervention is, is crucial. So that's what I would say to some people that the way to wait to see model is detrimental and you need right. to intervene as quickly and as soon as you recognize that there's a problem. There's a reason they have a, a, zero, a birth to three program for kids. Mm -hmm. There's a reason they have a three to five program for early childhood. There's reasons for that. Yeah. And um, whoever, Joanne, whoever your colleague is that is struggling with that I'm sorry for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, but it is the law. So right. you're, and that's, you're exactly right. But I feel like when you go to a district and they say it's not, someone's just repeating something everybody else has said. Right. You know, so I've often said, well, can I see your policy? Like, I just want to see the policy. So I try to ask nicely, like, why is that? Where is that written down? Because you can also find the policy that says they're required to report and then they're required to test and then they're required to put, you know, um, supports yeah. in place. So if they can't show it and you can, it doesn't have to be a, he said, she said, it could be a, here's what I have. Show me something that refutes that. Mm -hmm. And they won't exactly. be able to do that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You, you need to have your information. You have to be armed. 
Okay. Right. Okay. So let's look at the next one. Okay. Do pictures or characters or superheroes enhance or help, you know, make it easy for young readers? K through five level. I would think anything that excites kids and, and, and enhances their learning is, is a great thing to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not sure if this question is, should you have like a picture cue or um, in the books, or are you just saying some kind of like fun mnemonic to get kids excited? Um, I don't know. So if, if you're saying like, you know, do you need to have like a, every story has a character that goes with it? Like, you know, an S is superhero Susie or something. I don't know. I don't know that that's necessary. That seems like a lot of extra cognitive load. Um, you know, we don't want them reading from the pictures if, if that's kind of what you're referencing, but, uh, I'm a big fan of fun because I kind of feel like if you're learning and enjoying it at the same time, you're going to learn more and you're going to be, um, excited. Exactly. Um, you know, oftentimes people are, we'll talk about multi-sensory as, you know, does it actually teach you to read is debated, but, um, as a memory technique, multisensory has been proven over and over and over again, you know, so the more, you know, senses you have to learn something, the more likely you are to retain it. Um, but, you know, that's mostly been tested with things like, you know, your visit to the Grand Canyon or, you know, <laughs> but, but if you see something, you hear something, you touch something, you experience something, you're probably more likely to remember exactly. it. And there's lots of data on that. Um, just, you know, do I think, you know, you don't always need that to read, you know, mm -hmm. um, you can learn to read in a very boring way, or as long as people are doing it correctly, you know, it doesn't have to be exciting, but why not make it exciting? Let's okay. This is a long one. Yeah. Let's go to Carolyn Galbraith. Um, okay. I, um, I watched a YouTube video once and I believe that it was you, Donna, who was talking in it. You had mentioned a phrase. What's the possible ways to spell a word? What's the probable way to spell a word? Does that sound like something you talked about? That really yeah. stuck with me and guided me for some new questioning. I'm wondering how we figure out the probability of words in a sequence of phonics letters. The position principle, such as the, such as the X rule was mentioned. I don't know. That kind of sounds like me. Um, but, and I think Donna, before we started, you and I were talking about that. Like, so if you, if you hear a certain sound, like we, we were talking about that, the R sound, right? If you're going to use an R, um, you know, at the beginning of a word, I mean, most likely it's going to be an R, you know, and if you know that the word has something to do with twisting, like, you know, ring or wrap or whatever, like I'm going to wrap a candy wrapper um, versus wrap, like wrap a song. Um, if it has to do with twisting, that it'd most likely be WR. If you're going to talk about a rhino and RHI, that RHIN has to do with nose. So if you got rhinoplasty or a rhinoceros, then you would spell that way. So you do have percentage of choices for what can be in a certain place. The same thing with an X. I mean, an X is at the end, uh, when it's at the end of a word, it's a, you sh it's a plural canceler. So like box, if there's an X there, we know it's not more than one box. We know that the word box is plural. So if we hear box in a sentence, I have a box, we have to use an X at the end because CKS would be plural. So that is position, right? So we know that depending on where it is in the word, where we hear it, certain things are going to be presented certain ways, right? So um, like if we had exam and we hear the G -Z together, GZ is not a blend. Um, and we hear the, that sound, then we know it's going to be an X. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's what really what sound you hear is, does dictate what spelling you use, um, but also the meaning and what your knowledge is of other, you know, phonics concepts. So, um, yeah, yeah. Position matters, right? We don't, if we have like the word fluff, we don't have to start with two Fs, you know, but we do have to end with two Fs. 
Um, so it depends on, you know, what is governing that, that word and what sounds we hear. Um, so I think so. I mean, I don't know that I've said it that way, but that kind of sounds, you know, there are possible what I used ways. What say was, um, how many ways do you know to spell the A sound? And then they would list them. Oh, I don't do that. <laughs> that's what I did. Well, you know, well, to me, that's, to me, that's like, doesn't tell you when and where to use it. No. You know? And that's why no. yours is so much better because it's more detailed. Again, yeah, I think, yeah, well, I mean, I, I had, a, I had a kid, I had a kid come to me and I, and I just, he was new and we were talking and I said, do you know how to spell the E sound? And he said, yes. And he goes, E, E, comma, E, comma, E, A, comma. Oh. He had memorized the list down to the commas. Yep. But he couldn't apply it anywhere. He couldn't apply it, right? Yeah. Have you ever have you ever seen the um there's this, you know, they say reading is crazy. I'm trying to find it, but the a, a oh, I think board, I know what book you're talking about. There was a reading is crazy like a meme, and people are like, you shouldn't learn how to, you know, um, uh, you can't even figure it out. So I'm just gonna write it on here, but I saw, um, so they tried to say that this word was fish. Oh, okay. And I was like, because this could be a f at the end of laugh. Yeah. And this could be the sh in like shun, you know, like, oh, and I sure. don't even know where they got the O from, but, but that's position right there. Like a GH is only going to say f right? If it's, if it's at the end of a word and there should be a U before it, it's going to, mm. at the beginning of the word, it's going to say, G, you know, so it's like position matters when you would use it. And that's just ridiculous because TI saying sh, that would never happen unless, you know, there was a base that ended in a T and an ION following it, you know, like, so, so these things, it's really, English isn't crazy, it's just a lot of people don't know enough about it to 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 answer these questions so they've memorized everything and i think one of the big thing is is that a lot of teachers found learning to read and spell easy and that um is hard when they're trying to teach the kids who don't find it easy you know, it's, it's like Michael Jordan teaching the kids who don't know how to just do it. Right. You know, like how does, right. how would he coach them? I watched his documentary and he didn't seem like he'd be warm and understanding. about it. <laughs> No warm fuzzy. <laughs> no warm fuzzies. You either just do it or get off my court. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's funny. Right. All right. Which one you want to take next? Okay. So, um, Let's see. I don't, I don't really want to talk about particular programs. Do you, I prefer not to like criticize yeah, I don't wanna, particular mm, programs. Yeah. I think that there's a couple questions about particular programs. And I think really it is the more you learn, the better you're able to discern what the programs have and what they don't have. Right. So, you know, as you, you know, I'll go to any training I've been to, I mean, over the last 30 years, I mean, I don't even know how many, if somebody offers a training to me, I'm like, sure, because I mean, you can't learn anything new unless you go experience something. And I, True. I've had lots of trainings where I thought the only thing I learned is I don't want to do that, but it's so, but now, you know, now I know. Right. Um, and I feel the same way, you know, throughout the years, I've been to so many trainings, but every time you go, you learn something new. Um, and it just keeps reinforcing what you do know, and maybe ways to tweak it. Like Jennifer and I were talking earlier today, and she brings so much to um, the table that I'm not familiar with a lot about morphology and the use of it. And I would love to know more about that. So you know, again, we don't, especially if you're just starting this journey, you know, there's so much to learn because we didn't learn it in college. <laughs> right. I didn't learn it in college. When I went back to school, I took a class in my master's on reading and it was all about 
um, interest inventories. If you can get them interested, then they'll start reading. And I, you know, I hadn't gone to undergrad for reading instruction. So I, that just sounds so bizarre to me because I'm like, well, like I said earlier, I'm interested in being a supermodel. <laughs> it's like, just because I'm interested, I'm interested in being a billionaire. Mm -hmm. um, how do I, how does that, you know, turn into an actual end result? Um, my professor couldn't answer. She couldn't answer that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, just because I, I think my kids always wanted to read, they didn't like struggling, um, you know, but that to me was just made no sense. And that she could, that would be the whole premise of a course was mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. Connection to okay. OG. OG so, has yep. students that say letters instead of the sounds when learning red words. Okay. My thinking is that students should say the sounds along their arms S -A -D, instead of S-A-I-D. Your thoughts? Well, well, um, if you said S -A -D, I don't know how you're going to figure out how to spell it if you don't know right. the spelling here. Um, you know, and, so. And I think by tapping your arm, you're not reinforcing the motor act you're just tapping your arm right i think you know if you wanted to spell said and you said um asked your students how many sounds do you hear and they were like you know S eh, you know what sounds do you hear S eh, d how many are there three okay right? then we need to talk about what part of the word isn't being spelled the way we've learned right so in, in another they can way to spell this and the d, you know, is what did your mouth say? How many sounds did your mouth say instead of what you heard? That's the other right. speech, with, you know, print thing. Yep. What did your mouth say? So, how many sounds did your mouth say? Three. Exactly. And so, and what, you know, what I've seen done is instead of saying um, S, instead of writing the E and then crossing it out and putting a heart and all that, you're going to put, you're just going to write S. A I D, but you're going to go S ed, and you're writing A I and D because right. you're reinforcing because there are other words that have exactly right. Totally agree with that. It says, ah. Yeah. But I, but when I'm doing this, I already have the word said written on the board. Like I'm not going to try to get them to spell it wrong. We're going to talk, I'm going to say, this exactly. is the word said, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to talk about why it looks like this. I mean, the thing is, is that there's also a morphological piece to this, as there are to almost all of our high frequency words that you can bring in and say, this is what they, how they used to pronounce it. And this is how mm -hmm. we do it now. Um, you know, and the, and I being swapped out for a Y is pretty common in old English. So, you know, when we have like, um, you know, when we look at, uh, they and then there, you know, that Y mm -hmm. to an I, there's there's several different words that you could put together and talk about how that I went from say to said can happen where that Y changes to an I and show them those other words and learn those at the same time will help them to, to see the relationship between them. Right, make yeah. the connection. Because they have to hang it on something. And if yes. you could hang it on something that makes complete sense to them, you're more apt to learn that and, right. and use that so as like a sound, retrieval process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sound, sound, symbol, and meaning. Like the reason we have, you know, letters is because we decided we want to be able to remember what we said. <laughs> so like right. that came about yeah. and, Sounds you know, and so we're spelling that. Yeah, our spelling represents um, words that we say. So talking about how we feel that in our mouth and how many right. sounds we produce, um, but also, you know, putting in the, you know, little bit of the historical pattern and, and why these are spelled this way, I think is helpful because kids, they they respond better to like real reasons than they do a bunch of mnemonics. Like who needs a mnemonic for every word they can't spell? you know, um, you know, like that's just a lot of clutter, but if you can show them a pattern, 
and anchor it to the sound and the symbol, then I think that's the best I agree way. completely. Let's do the one by Grace. Let's do the next one. Okay. Um, how does one persuade an administrator or district to leave behind the queuing system and embrace an SOR approach? I feel like I'm chasing my tail at work um, and there's not movement. I'm in California. Okay. Well, if you're in California, I'd love to visit you. <laughs> Is that, that all San Francisco? Week. Yeah. Unified district. Yeah. I spent all last week in negative 20 degrees and I did not like it. Um, so I don't want to but... hear it. <laughs> don't no. let her fool you. She's in, she's in Atlanta. I'm in it's Atlanta right now. It's 60. Yeah. But, but. I'm swapping any time. <laughs> um, but anyway, the thing that I have noticed about administrators um, is that a lot of people go to administrators with problems, not solutions. And, you know, hmm. they complain and administrators just hear complaints all day long, but they don't really hear solutions. Uh, and so, but, so when I, when I talk to teachers and I say, well, go to your principal and ask if you can just show, you know, at the next staff meeting or something, some new, you know, cool thing you learned um, to everyone, because it's made your life easier. Instead of saying you're doing it wrong, we're all doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Get them on board with something that excites them that seems like it would be easier that makes sense because you know I have a couple I keep up my sleeve for people to say oh well you know of course you know this but um and then I tell them some interesting fun fact that they don't know but they don't admit they don't know because I told them I'm sure you know this but I know a lot of Love our teachers that. don't that way you're not saying you're wrong you're doing something wrong um I think it's just like anything like I can complain about my kids and how messy their rooms are, but I don't want Donna to be like, Hey, how are your messy kids doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I can call them messy. That's right. So what about saying to them, um, instead of saying science of reading, because I think that that could really be a turnoff. Can you use like evidence-based practices? Or I just, I just learned this really cool new thing. I'd like to start using this in my classroom. You know, what do you think? I don't know. I, I think that's, I think that's great. Um, I've gotten more, um, you know, traction with, um, you know, just modeling the things and, and people going, how did you do that? Or could you show me that? Then I have getting in someone's face about it. Cause sadly I've done both. <laughs> um, and then Didn't learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but you get, you know, don't give them big things. Cause that I did that too. Like my daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia in first grade and I dropped off a giant book of overcoming dyslexia on her desk, which she didn't have time to read and nor did she have any training or understanding, but, um, I learned to kind of shift it to be, you know, do you want to go to this, you know, training or I've heard this new thing or just you know here's a great podcast if you want to check this out you know like those kinds of things I had one of my members who actually went through this change process and she went and talked to her superintendent I believe I and I think it's on the Facebook uh, no, no it's on the um, SOR um, YouTube channel uh, the SOR YouTube tube channel and it's, it's her process of what she, so she created this binder and she went in and she talked about to the superintendent. So you could do the same thing with your principal and say, here are some things I've been researching here. This is what I found, blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, I could look that up for you and, you know, maybe post it, but um, it, it's, it shows that you're being um, uh, um, inquisitive and it shows that you're taking initiative and it shows that, you know, you're not happy with your scores. You could bring in your data and just say, you know, I'm not liking my data. Is there anything that I can do? And then, you know, maybe um, do you have any colleagues that you can influence in your team at least? And you can, there could be at least two of you doing the change, the shift. Um, offer to do a book study. Shifting the Balance is a great book that really for, for districts that are um, 
really dragged in their feet. It's a nice soft landing place that in a safe place, I think, for, for people to use that book. Or, or even their website has lots of things that you can go to um, that just help ease that transition in a safe way. And, and people are emotionally attached to it, like you said. So <laughs> think about how you'd want to change somebody's mind about their political party or their exactly. religion. <laughs> right. You know, like, you know, bombarding them with facts. We know facts don't really change minds the way that they should. Um, you know, so getting them emotionally to start to feel better about it tends to get people on board a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been brought into districts where the administration has said, do not insult the program that they had, which I won't name, but nobody right. likes, um, and don't say anything bad about it, you know? And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I won't because they, they, right. So many people believed in it so strongly. Um, and I've learned from that because at first I was like, I can't support that. And it was three queuing and all that. And, um, and they're like, I know, but the, the administrator told me once they start learning what you're going to teach them, they're going to start to see the holes and what they, it is that they're using. And this was a long time ago. Um, and she was absolutely right because then, because, because they said, the teachers immediately said, well, what you're teaching us go along with what we're doing. And I'm like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then as time went by, they're like, well, you know what I'm noticing that I think this is going to work better. And I don't see where this is, you know, they right. sort of started dropping it and it was a slow, you know, more comfortable conversion for a lot of people um, to get on board with, with something else. And I've, because I've used they, that because they times. discovered it themselves. It wasn't you exactly. telling them. Yeah. Exactly. They brought it to me. They're like, well, you know, I really don't think they go that well together. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, probably not. You know, what do mm -hmm. I use these things for? I'm like, well, you can use them for reading practice passages. Which leads to our next question, actually, exactly. about leveled <laughs> readers. Um, what should I do with my leveled readers? My school has. It's risky or bad to allow our students to still read them. I was thinking of taking our school's leveled library and pushing them into the most appropriate classrooms for the kids to use as fun readers or just extra practice books. What do you suggest? I say never get rid of books. Um, I, I do say, though, make sure that when kids are your beginning readers, that, that that's not the book that they're reading. You have to use something that they're capable of reading and decoding. And then as they ease into, um, as they become more uh, proficient readers, about mid first grade, if you're, if you're laying the foundation right, you should see a shift between January and March when kids are just starting to, like, it's like magic happens. They just start taking off and start reading, become readers. Um, and so you really don't want to, what I would say is they become extra books in your room. Um, you don't want to get rid of them. You, you just want, you, you don't want to instruct from them, but you don't want to get rid of them either. I mean, and kids don't, you know, exist in a vacuum, like decodable readers are there. So you can see what I've taught is being applied. And that's really what decodable readers are there for, because you don't want to just throw out reading with lots of words and concepts that they don't know. You wouldn't hand them a math worksheet with mostly addition and a little bit of algebra. You know, like you, you want to see that, can they do it? It doesn't mean they don't know algebra because lots of kids, you can say to them, there were three cookies. Now there's only one cookie, <laughs> you know, they know like, okay, they're solving for X. <laughs> well, they took two cookies, you know, so that's algebra because, and kids don't live in a vacuum of reading either. Some of them are, you could just get started and it, it just sends kids off and they are just off and running. Other kids are going to lead, need a lot more repetition, but those other books give them the opportunity to try to flex their muscle on other words. And I think that's great, you know, and right. Well, and that's the other thing the, the, the research now is showing that if we're not allowing kids to have um, set for variability where you're practicing what sounds flexing the vowel sounds, and then you figure out the word that that's a very powerful 
exercise that we go through as readers and it start and it becomes part of our um, repertoire of self-correcting. Well, natural readers automatically do it and kids who are not natural readers don't. So mm -hmm. I start off every training with this word. Okay. And I'll say, can you sound it out? And people will say, Gylet, and I'll say no, and they'll say gylet, and I'll say no. So someone will say gillot, and I'll say no, and they'll say, you know, they they can then they'll say, j j you know, the they'll accent the first syllable, and and then they'll accent the second syllable, and then they'll I'll say no, and then someone will go gelo, they'll turn it into French, right? So <laughs> it happens every single time the same way. Someone, you know, the hard hard g, soft g, open syllable, closed syllable, accent the first syllable, accent the second syllable. And then when you run out of options, go to French, right? And um, like Merlot. So what right? is the right answer? <laughs> there isn't one. Because there is no one. I, I just took the word pilot and changed the first letter. And that's all I did because I want people to see that good readers use set for variability. They flex vowels. They flex accenting. They do it automatically and they don't even realize they always start off with the most frequent, you know, usually an open first syllable. Then they'll go to closed. Then they go to, you know, soft G and then they switch their accenting because more like more than likely the first syllable is going to be accented, not the second. But if right. I say no, they accent the second. Then when I still say no, they go to French. That is a very normal progression that a natural reader will follow, right? Poor readers look at that word and say, gloat or go right. or yeah. who knows, you know, um, because they don't even know how to attack it. So right. that, you know, flexing of the point. vowel and that set for variability is, is something that if you're a natural, you have to know that your kids who are struggling are not going to come by that naturally and they're going to need instruction. Yeah, that's excellent right point. Now. All right, for we sure. got time for one more. What okay. are your thoughts on using the, okay. three, the queuing method with young readers? Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No, it goes against the science. It goes yep. against the science. It doesn't mean that you can't sit and read with children and say, what do you see in the picture? Like, right. but it means that you shouldn't be using the picture to figure out the words. Right. You know, like it, you know, people don't have, you don't have to just say, I don't have any more picture books. We're going to start with war and peace. You know, like it's because you know, like, imagine the illustrated version of War and Peace. How big would that be? But but that's, you know, we we have to think through, the, you know, like Donna knows that this is my thing. The question behind the question, like, are pictures all bad? No. The reason we have pictures are we're teaching kids what should be going on in their head. Once we take the pictures away, they are responsible for creating their own pictures. So you know, that's how you remember things. You create a picture in your mind. So it's just, we don't want kids looking at the first letter and guessing. We don't want them looking at the pictures to figure out what the words are. No, I, you know, they I can't can tell you how the picture to verify their, yeah, their word, their guess, right. not a guess they're decoding. Right. But yeah. it's still, you know, it's, it just shouldn't be the only thing they have to, to rely no. on. Right. So okay, we got so I, I scroll down and there's mm -hmm. uh, shifting the balance. I can't type it in. So it's um, Carrie, um, Carrie Yates and uh, Jan Birkins are the author of Shifting the Balance. Okay, you may, you mentioned reading is crazy. Do you have a reference to look for some good examples to share with teachers? Um, what that reading isn't crazy. <laughs> I think examples of. I didn't get that far. <laughs> uh, I'm going down. Um, um, yeah. So I see like, what are some, I know we're running out of time, but um, some good resources for diving deeper into morphology. Um, I think Sue Hegland's book is really good. Um, Beneath the Surface of Words. I think that's a really good one. Um, you'll see a lot, you know, find out a lot from that. Um, you know, how do you get students with poor memory to remember all the rules? I think um, it's the way you do the rules. Um, you know, the rules are going to apply to hundreds of thousands of words in a lot of cases. So learning them is important. Um, but it's the practice and, and showing the similarities between the rules. So many of our rules are the exact same thing. We're just protecting sounds. Um, 
And so if you can show them the relationship between those rules, then I think that that's a good idea. Okay. So Grace said, what if, this is back to Grace and her dilemma of people not shifting. What if you have an effective program that works and she's seeing results, but she won't implement the program for classroom teachers? I guess you can only do what you can do. You can only control what you can control. Um, you can do things outside of school. You can hold a book study with maybe people that are at your school. You know, I can't believe you're the only person at that school that's that's alone. Um, right. I mean, that's not willing, that you're the only person at the school that's willing to change. There's gotta be others. And those are the people you have to hang with. Um, and if you're not getting that, I mean, I can imagine there are people like that, you know, you're a lone wolf. Um, you know, go find other people to hang with that that do embrace your your what you're believing and what you're doing and practicing because you need to get stroked somewhere and you need to be verified that you're doing the right job and not to give up hope. I mean, I've I get plenty of calls from people that are just at their wits' end, right? So oh, I, I just got to that. Crazy. Where I said that reading is crazy, I just I said it is not crazy. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, I just got to that. No, it is not crazy. It's it has very reliable patterns. And um, and so I think that is uh, important. And I think when you tell kids that reading is crazy, you're basically saying, Don't bother learning any anything else I'm gonna tell you, because it's not gonna make any difference. Um I always say like when you're raising your children, you don't say there's 480,000 ways to, to die just by walking outside your house. <laughs> you say, you know, like, just I mean, careful. you get right. You say, be careful. And, you know, as they get older, you're like, make sure you have car insurance and health insurance, you know, cause you know, life is 80% reliable and 20% you want insurance for, <laughs> um, you know, like, it's it's the same way with our language. If I said life is crazy and like a meteor could hit you or you could fall off a chair and die or whatever, my kids would never leave my house, which you know nobody wants. But um, you know, it's it's about just giving them hope that there is a system and not taking away by telling them that it's crazy. That that does kind of bother me. Even if you don't think it's a hundred percent makes sense, keep moving forward and and looking for more evidence for different words and how they relate to one another. Okay. So is it's there anything time. else that we've gone through? Yeah. No, actually time to quit. Um, yep. So the last you. one is good question because it is, will we receive a PD certificate for this webinar? And yes, um, we'll send you an hour so you can submit it for um, continuing ed for whoever will take it. Um, and, but we cannot customize it with your name. So we will send you one with an email. Um, I'll go back and look at some of these questions and type up some of the authors and, um, you know, the questions that were asked so that you can, we can answer some of them we didn't get to. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Donna for taking time tonight. Thank to you, Jim. This was so much fun. It really was. And we could do this again. I really like it. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for coming and Thank you for coming. Spread the word. And um, you know, we've got lots of we've got our SOR page and we've got the hub for reading um for um professional development. There's we've just thanks. And join your state organization. There's a almost every state has a science of reading page, so you can see right. what's going on locally. Um and don't give up. There's a huge community of people who want to support you. So, sure. Um, and the kids deserve it. So, they deserve great teachers and exactly. teachers with great training. So, don't give up. All right. Thank you all so much. All right. Good Take night, care. everybody. Bye. Bye bye.